I have a situation where I'm descending at best glide. The airplane is shaking like crazy. I ended up having screws come out of the instrument panel, dropping in my lap. The crankcase snaps, cracks open, and I start getting white smoke coming out of the engine compartment while it's still vibrating and shaking. It's hard to make good choices when the airplane feels like it's tearing itself apart. So we were flying on March 28th of 2023 on our way to Sun and Fun. Uh, my company Redbird uh, exhibits there and I had myself and then two passengers that are employees of Redbird. That morning we took off from San Marcos, Texas, which is where the airplane is based. And my flight plan was to Albany, Georgia, but that was really just to stay on the north side of the, of the storms. There was a significant amount of thunderstorms, convective activity in uh, southern Louisiana and along the Florida Panhandle. So we were about two hours into the flight. we had had to make one slight diversion to the north because the storms were building. I could see them off to my right side, and we were starting to get into sort of the smaller buildups that accompany a large system like that. At 15,000, we leveled off, pulled the mixture back to, to Lena Peak. Everything was looking normal. And then maybe a minute, minute and a half after I uh, had pulled the mixture back, I noticed a distinct reduction in power. The airplane is turbo normalized. So at 15,000, I, I should get about 30 inches of manifold pressure with the turbo. And I looked over and I had about 19 inches manifold pressure, which is obviously a problem. Um, and my fuel burn was sub 10 gallons an hour. That turbo has a number of failure modes. And um, if, it, if you get in that situation, the most common, honestly, is uh, something on the induction system comes off. A hose pops off, and you basically have a normally aspirated bonanza, and it's not a big deal. There are a few other modes that are much bigger deals, um, and I uh, honestly didn't give them the respect they deserved. And so I treated it really as an induction system problem from the beginning, which is just you know, I'm an optimistic guy, and when uh, faced with that situation, my gut reaction in that situation was to think, it'll work itself out, it'll be okay. But, you know, there's, there, are, there are times in the, in the cockpit where optimism is not the right choice. Once I noticed the turbo um, was not functioning, which was um, apparent, you know, if it's boosting, nine, if you only have 19 inches of manifold pressure in that airplane, the turbo is not working. My initial reaction was it's an induction system problem. Um, I turned the, you know, I put the fuel pump on high, I, read, I put the mixture back to rich, I tried to readjust, sort of do the opposite of what you just did, which is kind of the standard. Uh, obviously that had no impact. That airplane has an altitude compensating fuel pump that is um, just for this situation, so the engine doesn't quit um, in high altitude um, if you lose the turbo. Tried to troubleshoot it for, it felt like five minutes, it was probably about 30 seconds, and then um, I diverted to Meridian, Mississippi, um, asked the controllers for a diversion to Meridian and started a, a rapid descent. Because again, I was thinking this is an induction problem. I want to get down where the air is a little more dense, the air current, airplane's going to have some performance. One of the issues that really came up is that um, in my airplane, I have a JPI 730 engine monitor where it's a digital engine monitoring system where I have um, CHTs and EGTs turbo inlet temperature, oil temp, fuel flow, all the stuff, except when it was installed, they didn't install an oil pressure sensor. The oil pressure is still the round analog gauge that came from the factory, and it's at the bottom of the stack. So unfortunately, in your scan, when you're dealing with this, you spend a lot of time looking at the engine monitor, you come back, check your flight attitude, autopilot, whatever, make adjustments for the diversion, and then eventually I got around to checking the oil pressure um, and noticed that I didn't have any. As soon as I saw that, I pulled the throttle all the way back and started um, arresting my descent, you know, essentially trying to maintain some altitude and go into best glide um, to, you know, divert to an airport, hopefully. As a flight instructor, I've talked about and trained the idea of uh, engine seizing because of oil starvation. The engine's made of different metals. They heat and expand at different rates. And what ends up happening is the piston will expand faster than the cylinder does without lubrication or, or temperature control from the oil, and it gets stuck. That is not a binary event. It's not like you have an engine that's fine, and then a second later, it's seized and stopped, and it's all fine. What ends up happening is that individual pistons start sticking and it starts vibrating like crazy. The process of the engine seizing was way more violent than I ever anticipated. What happened was the, those pistons break and there's a lot of pressure in there. The rods, the connecting rods break um, and the, cam, the valve push rods will end up snapping too. 
and they put holes in the crankcase. And then when that happens, there's still, even, even if all the oil has, the, pump, fuel pump, the oil pump has pumped all the oil out of the engine, there's still a quart or two in the sump that it can't get to. And that oil is still there, and the, there's a pressure differential from inside the case and in the engine compartment. So all that oil that's in the engine comes out, and that ends up on the exhaust, and I start getting white smoke coming out of the engine compartment while it's still vibrating and shaking. I responded as though I had a fire, so I put the nose down to get airflow through the um, engine to blow it out. I um, actually ended up turning off my avionics for about a minute. I calmed down, recognized this is not an engine fire. There is no fuel running into the engine compartment. It's just oil burning off the exhaust. And so turned everything back on, got back into Best Glide, and that was at about 7,000 feet. And I recognized that we weren't going to make it to an airport. Emergencies and situations like this are not always clear in the moment, and you can be overwhelmed by, by the, the, the sheer magnitude of everything that's happening. I um, relatively quickly picked a field um, that looked flat, looked long enough, and so I entered a, um, it's called the high key, low key approach, uh, where you do a turn all the way around, 360 degree turn, and the high key, low key approach gives you a ton of options, because you can vary your rate of descent by turn, essentially. The, the harder you turn, the more you'll descend, um, and you, but you don't have to commit to having flaps down or gear down. So I was clean the whole way around until basically short final, knew I had the runway, cleared the trees, I was about 100. You good, Greg? Yeah. All right, we're gonna call the FAA in a second. Everybody call their families. I'm an optimist, a lot of pilots, tend to be. It, optimism is frequently rewarded in our society and you end up with an airplane. Um, however, there are situations that really demand immediate response. In that airplane, um, losing manifold pressure like that is one of maybe two events that demand an immediate response. Not because of the probabilities of a catastrophic failure, but the, um, the, the failure modes lead to some really bad options. If it is bad, it's gonna catch on fire within a minute and, or the engine's gonna quit within five minutes. The, one of the advantages of the turbo is that you can fly at altitude. At 15,000 feet, I actually had a ton of options. I have a 60 mile diameter circle that I can get to. At the very beginning, um, when I noticed that the uh, boost, that the manifold pressure was down, I, my first reaction was, dang it, in different words. Uh, because it was going to be inconvenient and because there, it was, you know, probably going to have some costs associated with it. In this case, even after I knew I, I didn't have oil pressure, I was still thinking about trying to get it to an airport that had a good mechanic, which is honestly just ridiculous, right? Let, the point is, let's get it down and save everybody on board, and then we'll worry about the rest. In fact, I could have diverted to the airport that the airplane is sitting at now and rolled it right into the shop where it's at. Um, I had other options at 15,000 feet, and that's one of those things that, looking back in hindsight, had I responded um, and gone into Best Glide, diverted to the nearest airport, um, you know, it'll, it would have worked out better, for sure. If that's your sort of worldview, you have to be cognizant of it and aware that um, there are certain situations that you just need hard and fast rules for and don't try to make a decision based on you know what you see or, or, or what you feel um, if 
you know, you lose manifold pressure, treat it like an engine failure, period, in this airplane. In training, um, and I'm guilty of this as a flight instructor as well, most emergencies um, are presented as somewhat clear-cut and isolated, and um, you sort of know what ha is happening. There's very little um, diagnostics that you're, that you're trained to do. It's not really trained what, the, um, what it means for the engine to fail. Uh, it, like engines don't fail in a way that's pleasant. You know, if you throw a rod or, it, I mean, really any engine failure scenario is probably going to be violent um, and it's going to catch you off guard. If you read most accident reports, those are developed over a series of, of poor decisions or decisions made with limited information. Um, and that's how the real world happens. It's not crystal clear. It's not presented in a, in a clear cut, oh, I'm just going to read this checklist off the book kind of way. This incident has really focused my attention on, um, on the value of scenario training specifically and how you respond to, how pilots are, are trained to respond to, to situations, um, not just in initial training, but ongoing proficiency training. You know, it's, it is true that 80% of accidents, 80% um, of fatal accidents are, are pilot related, um, but that still leaves 20% of accidents that are not in the part 91 pilot, single pilot in an airplane, um, we definitely don't focus enough on um, handling emergencies as they are actually happening in the real world. I think the main thing um, that should be taught um, for these sorts of situations are not really specific to um, a specific failure mode or anything like that. It's more about um, the way you think about and approach problems in the cockpit and the getting comfortable with the idea that you make decisions under opacity and you don't have all the information. And even if you do have all the information, even if it's all there, you may not be interpreting it correctly. You know, how do you keep thinking through the problem even after you've made a choice um, just to double check that it's the right choice? And I think a sim um, is an excellent place to get that practice and, and a well-developed, well presented scenario that gives you multiple choices with varying degrees of right and wrong um, is, a, is a fantastic tool and, and really should be uh, a part of every serious pilot's training. Being a Part 91 general aviation pilot is actually one of the really unique things um, that you can do in life. The ability to be responsible for and have complete authority over the operation of an airplane in the real world with real situations and with real outcomes is it, it's rare there's not many places in the, in your life where you can have that kind of responsibility